Okay. I've got a hypothetical scenario for you. Good. Okay, so let's say I'm working on a production and I've got multiple large teams of game developers and they are situated all over the world. So there's one in the US, there's one in Asia Pacific, and there's one in Europe. Okay, so minimal overlapping working hours. Yes, absolutely. And on top of that though, we didn't purpose build these teams for this project. So all of these were existing teams working on different things and now they're all working together. All right, so they were already functioning before, mm -hmm. therefore they must have had a way of working, uh, their different planning tools like Jira, Google Docs, uh, and uh, no central source of information before. Yes, that's, that's true. Uh, and one more thing, <laughs> we're also still hiring while we're making the game. So these teams are all still growing as the game's coming together. Okay, so they are growing independently mm -hmm. and uh, they have different org structure. And I imagine, given the world that we live in, uh, uh, big personalities in different places. Yes, that's true. Fantastic. <laughs> Welcome to our talk harmonious co-development in large teams. So the kinds of problems that we've identified in that hypothetical scenario are really common in distributed co-development, which is exactly what we've been doing here at Wargaming Sydney on an unannounced IP. So uh, I think that the kinds of intersections between those kinds of problems really highlight the similarities and the differences between the kind of work that we do. Uh, so. Who are we? Uh, this is Stefano Martinci, who is the Dev Manager at Wargaming Sydney. And this is Ali McLean, our Product Manager here at Wargaming Sydney. The fastest way for us to describe the connection and the differences between our roles is that Ali works on the content, synthesizing the vision of what we're making, and Stefano works on the process of how we're making it. These two things are inseparable and we think about it as the process has to wrap around the shape of the content and the content must work inside the process. And when you draw it, it also looks like a donut. So with that in mind, uh, we've found a few key things in our distributed code dev utility belt that have helped us identify, react to, navigate, and predict the kinds of issues that come up when you have people scattered all over the world trying to make a game together. So the things in our utility belt that we're going to talk about today are wise agreements. So this is around uh, crafting vision, but also crafting mandates that make sense for teams. Uh, safety and failure, so knowing that there are going to be areas where you're experimenting, knowing that there are going to be areas where you're going to fail, and creating an environment where it's safe to fail in. Uh, also storytelling, so using storytelling as part of your planning methodology, and a mindset of continuous improvement. Let's start at the beginning. We have crafted mandates which take into account the skills and strengths of the sister studio. Okay, sorry, how do you actually <laughs> identify and know what your strengths are as a sister studio? Sure, this is an excellent question. I believe that uh, each studio starts with their people. Therefore, try to understand uh, which skills do you already have and what's the history of your studio. Mm -hmm. It's really important and you will discover what you really are good at and the history that you have and uh, it will become evident what the strengths are. Yeah, and I guess when you do that kind of analysis, uh, it probably helps ahead of choosing what your co-dev partner is going to be as well. I don't know if in, in your experience if uh, partner studios are usually quite similar or have really strong uh, differences and uh, compensate for each other's maybe gaps and that kind of thing. Absolutely, I believe that compensate is the word. It's uh, Co-development is hard. And uh, if you take that leap to go around the world, uh, to work with different people, it's because you need different skills and different experiences to really compensate what you already are doing. Another thing is, it's really important to come up with alignment on how we work, so delivery frameworks. And um, in our case, our head studio started at a, as a very small studio. Therefore, they had a ad hoc way of working. And uh, here at Wargaming Sydney, we were already uh, mature in using Scrum, and therefore we had to see if maybe using Scrum together and having certain spring cadences and these type of things would have helped. 
And starting with that, we also discovered that there might be an occasion in which we want to have a, a large number of people working one single problem. So we would have needed to, to scale Scrum. And at that point, uh, we decided to explore with Nexus, which is a framework that is scaling Scrum. Luckily enough, uh, in the months ahead, we discovered that uh, we didn't really need to, to work uh, at the same problem with too many people. Therefore, we, will, we have been able to scale back to just using Scrum per each stream of work. Mm -hmm. What is it that, I guess, having been on that journey, what is it about just using Scrum in, in whatever, whatever way? I'm sure that it's different, a little bit different from team to team. Um, what is it about that that brings value to distributed codev that maybe something like Nexus might have been too much? Or... Yeah, so basically you need to scale Scrum when you're really working on the same problem with a lot of people and it requires a lot of more coordination in that case but if you're lucky and uh, careful you can maybe create different mandates that are really precise and you don't need to have too many dependencies between a feature and another and then you can just run with your one team maximum two teams on one single feature and do vanilla scrum if you can i guess that's kind of the synthesis of what you were saying before about knowing what the development partner's strength is, and then using that to define a clear mandate which enables a much more simple way of working. Yes, absolutely. And in our case, we also discovered that uh, it worked really well if the division comes from the head studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, each stream of work has great autonomy on the implementation of this vision. So I fully agree that everything is so much easier when there's a really clear vision crafted by the head studio that, and that's coming from people like your game director or your creative director or, or whoever that would be. But I think it's really important also to acknowledge that um, vision crafting doesn't stop at the head studio and it also doesn't stop after the first ideation phase of a project. Vision crafting is something you need to do all the time. Um, so brace yourselves, I'm going to use the metaphor of the sea voyage. Uh, <laughs> Um, so before you can embark on your voyage, uh, your crew needs to know where they're going and why they're going there, but they also need to know what kind of voyage it's going to be. So uh, you're charting your course, I'm taking this metaphor way too far, you're, ch you're charting your course, um, you're looking at the weather forecast and um, you're visualizing what it's going to be like when you get there. Um, so back in game dev world, <laughs> this is uh, the the act, the practical task, and that's why I think it's it is important to think about visual crafting as a practical task because it sounds like quite a fluffy word. Um, you're synthesizing the feature requirements, the team goals, the team values, the creative philosophy, the tech requirements, all all of these things, um, taking everything that's that's in that mix and. You're turning it into something that you can hold in your hand, something that you can say out loud, uh, that can bring meaning to the work that the team is doing uh, every day, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is obviously a collaborative task. Yeah, I want to say it seems a, a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, this isn't something that I think producers need to do by themselves. And I think if they are doing it by themselves, then you have a problem. Um, in my case, I have a lot of really excellent people around me, be they game designers, uh, tech leads, team leads, you and uh, our, our partners in the UK studio, uh, who everyone contributes to that mix. Uh, I do think, though, that it is the producer or the product manager's responsibility uh, to synthesize all of those viewpoints and get, get that agreement with everybody and then make sure that that is communicated really clearly back out to the team. Um, so it's, yeah, it's about meaning and direction for what you're creating. And I mean, what could be more important than the meaning and the direction for what you're creating? Uh, so you shouldn't skimp on how you communicate that to people. So in our case, most of our teams are cross-functional teams where we've got engineers, designers, artists, all kinds of people. Uh, and all of those people with all of those different strengths and personality types, they all consume information differently. 
So when you're thinking about how you communicate your vision statement, this thing that brings meaning and direction to the work that you're doing, you should be thinking about communicating that in lots of different ways. So uh, verbally, obviously, you want to have those conversations with people and let them uh, engage with it and, and shape the vision in their own way and take ownership over it. But also think about visual mediums, think about mood boards, think about the kind of images that you're using, think about diagrams and mind maps and whatever is going to get into people's heads. But I think if you're going to live with a vision statement for a certain period of time, it has to be really solid. So going back to the sea voyage metaphor, <laughs> if you're not sick of it yet, um, um, I think this way of thinking about vision crafting as something that you do on dry land with all of the information that you have available to you, um, that's an, it's an important way of conceptualizing it. Um, and I think it's particularly prescient when you're talking about inter uh, international distributed co-development because when you are physically so far away from the people that you're making the game with, sometimes when you're at sea, you're very much at sea, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, I think so. So basically, in this metaphor, when you say dry land, you mean when you have that time to breathe yes. and uh, things are a little bit clearer, you need to prepare for the next bit because mm -hmm. once you are in the middle of doing something and there are deadlines, you won't have the time to find your way and if you didn't do the preparation for dry land, when you're at sea, there are problems. <laughs> and there's a storm rolling in, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, makes sense. You're wish that you'd done that planning uh, when you had the time, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we both know that in this kind of distributed co-dev environment, it doesn't, you can have really strong communication channels, you can have really great relationships, you can have really solid process, but there are still going to be times during the game development process where uh, communication isn't going to be as strong. You know, there might be a team that you have dependencies on, but they have a, a really wild deadline that's come out of nowhere for a particular play test or, or a UX test or something like that. Uh, where suddenly they're less responsive to your questions or uh, the project leadership might be working on um, a, f a green light presentation for example for a phase and that's taking up a lot of their energy so they're not spending as much time communicating things back out or responding to uh, nuanced uh, questions around game design. <laughs> you know, there, there are going to be times when, when you are at sea and um, if the team has a vision that is directly taken from and mapped to the vision for the project, but is also very relevant for them, and you know, when an individual comes to work every day, or logs on at home every day, yeah. <laughs> they can see the impact that they're having towards that vision, then having that kind of guiding light within the team itself for, for those at sea periods, I think that that uh, it makes course correcting a lot easier, but it also just makes navigating those those at sea periods a lot smoother for everybody. Absolutely. So what you're saying is that regardless how good you are when things are fine, mm -hmm. nice, it's really important that at any time you're able to switch on and be autonomous and knowing the direction, knowing what we said, uh, you can then self course correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's a really important part of. Being able to be a trusted co-development partner as well is, is knowing that, you know, if I'm the lead studio and everything's on fire, you're going to be okay. You know, if I just I leave you for a week or so, you're going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think um, talk, talking again about a vision on a per team basis, this, I, I want to stress this point because I think without specifically crafting a vision, whether it be a statement or a mood board or you know all of the above, uh, on a per team basis per phase, the project vision and the thing that the creative director or the game director said two years ago, you know whatever it may be, it becomes less and less meaningful uh, if you if you're not seeing that direct connection between what you're doing and what the vision for the project is. So I think a good um, a good litmus test for whether you've made a vision statement that's actually useful for your team is where does it belong? So if your vision statement can't be placed in your scope document, 
if it can't be placed on your tech spec, if it can't be placed on your game design document, um, then it's very unlikely that it's going to be coming up on a sprint to sprint basis, which is certainly <laughs> where it should be coming up when you're planning your sprints and your sprint goals. Um, but I would go even further to say that it should be coming up on a day-to-day -day basis in the conversations that you're having and the decisions that you're making. And I think if it isn't coming up, then it isn't working. So having a vision statement that can be repeated and be catchy and like maybe even have like an unusual word in it so that people can, can latch onto it, I think it's really helpful on a per phase basis, but it's also a trap. Because yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes if a phase is too long, uh, then your vision statement can become meaningless when you're repeating it all the time, but it can also be really daunting. Like if, you're, if your vision statement is for where you're going to be six months from now, uh, when you're six months away from that point, it can be a little bit scary. Um, so the story that you're going to tell and the way you're going to craft that vision throughout the project is something that must be considered at a roadmap level. Here's the thing, um, all roadmaps are made up. Okay. And the only thing that matters about your roadmap is the story that it tells. You're, you're okay with that statement? Yeah, okay, absolutely. Okay, cool. So I think I'm maybe 85% okay with that statement. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, a roadmap should be thought about, I think, as a storytelling tool. This is the way that they are the most powerful for a team and for a project overall. So for a roadmap to be effective in that way, you can start thinking about each item that's in your roadmap as kind of a story beat. So uh, to know what your beats are going to be, you need to know what the story is that you're telling. So this is where we can take cues from narrative design and story structure and go, go as far as that to think about the way that you're designing the roadmap and what story the roadmap is telling to the people who have to use it. Does that make sense? It does. So basically this ties into the fact that also is a roadmap is quite high level mm -hmm. and therefore you want to make it engaging by itself. Absolutely, yeah. When you, I feel like at, at the first glance of a roadmap, it should give you an indication of the journey that the team are on. So, um, some roadmap stories are going to be the hero's journey. So, the journey from the known into the depths of the unknown and, and back to the known again. Um, so, for example, a, a pre-production roadmap that starts with a new piece of technology uh, that has to be pulled apart and de-risked and adapted to emerging gameplay systems and then put back together at the end so that production can start. That's kind of a hero's journey. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's really it's that. crazy. I see. Yeah, I see. Um, so another roadmap might be more like a three-act structure. So um, your first act is that inciting event or idea. So this could be like a prototyping phase or like an innovation phase. Uh, and then act two is overcoming an increasing number of obstacles, which sounds like most roadmaps. <laughs> so this could be um, particular gates or, or UX testing or, or something like that. Um, and then the climax of act three could be your green light. It could be the gate that you have to pass and then the several weeks of bug fixing and then following up and fixing things afterwards. <laughs> so. so what you're saying is things is it seems to me that these roadmaps are built around the people that are making the product and not necessarily only the product. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, for a roadmap to be effective, uh, it, has to, uh, it has to bring people along on the journey. Okay. Yeah, so um, if you know the structure of this story you're telling, then you can give context to some of the more challenging parts of a phase of development. Uh, so your roadmap can kind of be your visual storytelling tool to keep people visualizing the journey and the road ahead rather than maybe the difficult part of the journey that they're in right now. So thinking about a roadmap as a storytelling tool, I'm not saying that you don't need to have a robust backlog or you're not just throwing a dart at a calendar and saying this is how long a milestone is going to be. Um, and I think particularly when it comes to Distributed co-development, when you're working with large groups of people spread across the world, having 
very well organized layers of information becomes really important. And I mean, this is the difference between someone having to wait 24 hours for an answer to a very simple question or uh, having to do a call at 10 p.m. when you're trying to go to sleep. <laughs> so yeah. um, we've been there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, think about Think about the kind of information that you need to have structured as a pyramid. So the bottom of the pyramid is your highest granularity of information. So your user stories in your backlog, refined, ready to go into a sprint. Um, there are more people on a large project who don't need that information than people who do. Yeah. Of course, yeah. since you're talking about a story level, a story is something that a number of them small number of that we need to implement, mm -hmm. therefore everybody else doesn't need to know yeah. that much detail, so it makes sense. But often that's the information you invest the most time in, <laughs> but it's the thing that's the least valuable to everyone else. <laughs> right, so the, the investment there is also because you have to produce a high number of them, yeah. but you shouldn't fall into the trap of putting too much in each of them. And you shouldn't only do that, that layer of information. Oh, absolutely not, <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Uh, which sometimes happens. Um, so then think about the middle of the pyramid, which is like your epics and your feature design documents and those kind of meaty, medium-sized chunks. And these are the things that are probably going to be of interest to other game designers on the project, probably going to be of interest to teams that have a dependency on your team or intersect intersecting features. Uh, these, this is the, the middle of the pyramid, and that's probably uh, where you would want to spend a, a almost equivalent amount of time, I would say, than to your stories. Oh, absolutely. I believe it even more because uh, it doesn't matter how great you are in terms of team and producer, you'll never find a way to have zero dependencies. Yeah. So it's really, really important that that layer is the one that is also understandable, easy to find, to then connect. And uh, I see this really in the pyramid. In the pyramid, when I enter at that level, I might want to see a, a type of granularity and other people another type. And as you mentioned, there might be people that are in between a feature team that they will need both granularities. Mm -hmm. And not having that bit that put in common and, and connect the dots uh, would be a big, big problem. Yeah, and, and obviously the top of your pyramid that, that gives context to everything else is what we've already talked about. So the roadmap, the, the overarching story, the, the vision statement, these are the things that, are, you know, no matter where you slice it all the way down, it's still a pyramid. <laughs> and I love you reinforcing this pyramid concept because everything has to be coherent. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, your narrative, I should be seeing bits of it even in the stories. Mm -hmm. so. There needs to be a, a sense of order and interconnectedness between all of those things. You yeah, know? otherwise not a pyramid. Yeah, otherwise yeah. it doesn't make sense, yeah, the whole thing falls over. Also, accessing the pyramid. So each each of these uh, pieces in granularity of information it needs to be easily accessible, it needs to be in a place where someone always knows where to find it. Uh, this is again the difference between those late night phone calls or someone having to wait 24 hours to get an answer to their question. Um, so if you're using like a project wiki or a confluence or something like that, then mm -hmm. that top of your pyramid should ideally be kind of a parent page which can then link down to the, the more detailed levels of granularity. And um, at Wargaming Sydney, for example, one of the things that I find we keep coming back to and, and keeps becoming more and more useful is uh, we have teams that are, are still growing and there are new people joining the project in, in different locations all the time. So when you've got somebody who needs a really high level of detail, not of the work you're doing right now or the work you're going to be doing six months from now, but the work that you did six months ago, that's a lot harder question to answer when you're in the midst of, uh, when you're on the moving train. <laughs> so uh, having things like sprint review videos or sprint analysis documentation that is created to a standard that is going to be helpful to people who are seeing this information for the first time or even for yourself looking back and needing to reference it, uh, having all of that live in that same reliable curated space. Uh, this is this is part of that, uh, having a, a robust pyramid of information. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe also that when you talk about these things, what I hear is also quality because basically when you're saying that these documentations, these things that you put together throughout the process, uh, 
they need to serve not only you and the people that you work with for years, but also newcomers and, and new teams and, and new partner studios that might be able to catch up and being on your same journey in, in a week time only if those things are at a quality that can be consumed. Definitely, and saves you a lot of time when those things happen on the fly as well. You've already got that robust information to back you up. Um, so I guess overall, what, we're, what I'm saying is that a meaningful vision statement that is mapped to clear and consistent phases within a roadmap that tells a compelling story, uh, which maps to reliably maintained and curated levels of information. This is the ecosystem that a production unit should create and maintain for this, for this harmonious uh, co-development that we're talking about. Fully agree. That's absolutely key. Great. Um, so this is, again, one of those things that sounds very logical uh, and makes a lot of sense and then can fall apart really quickly <laughs> because it takes work. Like you're saying, the, the quality is the most important thing and it's one of the first things that can drop when everything starts uh, going crazy and when the world's on fire or global pandemic, yep. <laughs> you're dropping things like your sprint review video or uh, updating the top of the pyramid page in your confluence when the roadmap changes. These are the things that can, can drop really quickly. Absolutely. And one thing that makes them so easy to drop, I believe it ties into the fact that uh, you could get lucky in the sense that if you don't do a number of things that are preparation, planning and revisiting, you can still do your job. And if no problem ever arises, you didn't need it. It's just that probably that's not our field of work. Yeah. One of the ways that you make sure that that effort is worthwhile is by always interrogating those processes. So if you're finding that you're not getting a certain number of views on a, on a regular video that you're producing, or if you're having meetings with people and realizing they don't have information that was communicated in a regular email that gets sent out, uh, then you need to interrogate those processes. And I mean, this is all part of that continuous improvement mindset that, that you're very focused on. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, we're going to look at that in the next chapter. Right now. <laughs> Great. And here we are on the continuous improvement bit, which is my favorite bit. <laughs> Absolutely essential. And before understanding how can we evolve and improve, it's important to understand uh, uh, where we are at the moment. Mm -hmm. So on one side, uh, we understood that uh, people need to have a long lasting relationship with a direct manager. And uh, we decided that has to be of the, of the same discipline so that you can enhance the trust uh, and uh, how this line manager can guide people to grow. Okay, but how does that work with, I guess, for, for people who have cross-functional teams? How yeah. does that operate if, you, if their team lead is not their manager? So, absolutely. What we came up with is uh, there is the entity team that requires to have somebody that is a dev dedicated and dedicating effort to maintaining the entity team a whole mm -hmm. and that's in our case is not a line manager of anyone and then you have every single individual that has a line manager that might be in a, another feature team or just slightly above the feature teams to maintain that relationship because the other bit that we need to clarify is that the business requires slightly different thing. The business requires to have a cross-functional team that are able to develop A to Z yeah. a feature. And typically you don't have number of team equivalent to the number of features that you need. Mm -hmm. You need to find a way to match the two entities, people's mm -hmm. side and the business side. Okay. So in this case, it's really important to understand uh, when you need to do something then always try to understand can I add this new feature or this new thing that you need to do on some existing thing and that's always the, the way to go. Mm -hmm. Often there is the problem that like no the team that is maybe finishing something doesn't have the right skills to transition to do something else and at that point we look at the whole and we reorganize ourselves but we keep 
the line management lines unchanged right. and we just changed the team composition. So it's allowing the kind of flexibility, like we, we all know that in any kind of game production things change all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so allowing that kind of flexibility while still giving people the stability of having a, a consistent relationship with their line manager so that they can also continue to grow and improve, right? We want to invest in people's growth in the long term. Yeah, spot on. And the last bit about this is exactly about the planning ahead. Because yes, we need to be flexible and things keep changing, but they don't need to change at the pace that you're not able to scout ahead. Mm -hmm. So if you do a careful planning, you can reap off the benefit of long lasting teams. Mm -hmm. If you just try to react, there is where everything falls apart. Now that we understood how we operate, and I should actually uh, create a disclaimer here, it doesn't mean that the other studio work like we work. And that's fine, especially because you want to have often retrospective to examine how everybody works mm -hmm. and how we interact. And it's kind of what we were talking about before in that you, every studio is going to operate differently to their strengths and the people that they have, and it doesn't have to, not everyone has to adhere to the same structure for it to be effective. Absolutely. And in this case, key is uh, know each other. Mm -hmm. Meaning that uh, in our case, for example, we're fortunate enough that we have been able, pandemic apart, uh, to visit each other very frequently. Mm -hmm. Every quarter, uh, a good number of people visited the, the head studio and vice versa. And that's to create really the bond uh, and, and, and clarify how can we better work together. Because otherwise you lose that connection as a human being mm -hmm. and it becomes impossible to criticize and overcome some differences. Yeah, I mean, nothing really beats face-to-face -face conversations, especially when they're difficult conversations. Yeah, you, I, in, in my career, I found that you cannot have a real difficult conversation if you don't have first the trust, given by the fact that I know where you sit mm -hmm. every day, all day. Yeah. That, that's really important. And uh, that's a formula that worked very well for us. And now we are paying a little bit the cost of the pandemic mm -hmm. and not being able to do that. Because what we used to do is to go there, as I said, once per quarter, and start the visit with retrospectives around what did we do in the past couple of months mm -hmm. of actual work. And then closing it, closing the visit with an actual retrospective on the visit itself yeah. to clarify how can we better communicate going on. Yeah. So clearly, when uh, people look at how they work so much, uh, they will find things that don't work. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. <laughs> uh, I believe that uh, the biggest enemy of a large production is its size. And to avoid bottlenecks and minimize handover, you need cross-functional feature teams. How many people do we need uh, for a feature? And uh, where a feature starts and ends, those two are very difficult questions to answer. Mm -hmm. Luckily enough, we have a lot of literature that can guide us in understand, uh, uh, try to find a balance between the size and what the scope of the work is. And, and we know that three to nine developers is a very good number for teams and team composition because of line communication and interaction with other teams. And therefore we know that below nine is no brainer, it's one team. Mm -hmm. How to co coordinate three or more teams? It's also a very difficult thing to do, but there is a lot of literature uh, to go with. And like for example, there are um, really strong uh, frameworks like the Nexus one that teaches you how to scale Scrum. Now, the problem that we had to face is that we need to find a way to coordinate 16 devs. Okay, so make three teams. Sure, mathematically, 16 <laughs> can be divided in a way that you can get three teams mm -hmm. that of a good size. The problem is that uh, you need them to coordinate these three teams. And uh, just because there is a way in which you can do it, doesn't mean that you don't have to pay the cost to do it. 
Okay, so you're saying that uh, there is an inherent cost in a team existing, and the more teams you have, the more prepared you have to be to pay that cost. Exactly. Yeah. There are ways that uh, help you doing that, but then you have to pay it. Okay, so two teams then. Sure. So the problem with two teams would be that uh, the split has to be a natural split. Mm -hmm. It cannot feel that we're splitting just for the sake of it, mm -hmm. although we know that one team of 16 people wouldn't work for, for many reasons of basic communication, for example. Yeah, so like for stand-ups or retros suddenly taking way too long or people feel like they can't contribute because of the size of the meeting, you lose intimacy, that kind of thing. Exactly, and, and that's what you don't want uh, to get to because the problem is that you have teams because you want to have these different inputs. Mm -hmm. And if you lose that because your team is too big, then uh, what's the point? And the two team bit, we are not quite sure how to, to divide it in a way that it makes sense and everybody has the information that they need. Yeah, I mean, it kind of relates back to what we were talking about earlier when it comes to vision. So if you're going to commit to crafting a per team vision statement for every piece of work, then that means the work has to meaningfully split between those two groups of people. Otherwise, your vision statement is meaningless, and if your vision statement is meaningless, as established earlier, then you have no meaning or direction to your work. So. Exactly, and that unfortunately, at the moment, is a problem that we're facing, and there is no ad hoc or easy way to solve it. Mm -hmm. So, like team size and navigating the cost of a team and having a clear vision split between team mandates and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I found that we're often in these spaces where we're navigating things we haven't done before or problem spaces that are evolving and changing all the time. And when that's happening, failure is inevitable in some, in some way. Yeah. Yeah, so if you accept failure and the idea of failure as an inevitability and just part of your narrative structure that we were talking about before. Um, the next step is how do you optimize around the inevitability of failure? So um, I'm not talking about adding contingency or that kind of thing or uh, calculating risk or anything like that. That's a whole other topic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just talking about how do you create an environment where failure is safe? So in co-development, in my opinion, one of the scariest parts of failure is the damage that it can do to a relationship because your relationships are already so hard to build when you're not in the same physical space uh, and when there's all kinds of dynamics that you're trying to navigate in a co-development situation. And so uh, anything that risks burning glue or damaging relationships is uh, a lot more heartfelt when it happens. Um, whether that be like missing a deadline or misunderstanding expectations or something just not working, uh, the, the chasm between people can really quickly broaden. And if someone falls into that chasm, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to get them back out. So what you're saying is that being perfect is the answer. <laughs> well, yes, sure. <laughs> but then we also said that uh, mistakes are inevitable. Uh -huh. So what can we do? <laughs> totally. About so I, I think that uh, the you have to build a safety net over that chasm, so mm -hmm. that people can bounce back faster, and so that you can keep their production moving when failure does happen. And that safety net is built out of trust. So. As you said, trust is something you can get by just being perfect <laughs> and yep. delivering. Uh, but trust is also something you can strategically target and think about and plan and invest in. And there are lots of ways that you can do that. And a lot of them will be tailored to the kind of stakeholders you have and the kind of working relationships you have. But a good overall way of thinking about it is to use the trust equation. Um, this is a nice, simple way to break things down into identifiable chunks. So the trust, the trust equation calculates trustworthiness as a combination of credibility, reliability, and intimacy over self-orientation. So intimacy is the piece of this equation that is the hardest to get uh, in, in, a, in a distributed co-development. And when you're on the other side of the world, um, the development environment that you're in needs to be intimate enough to enable connection between the right people as soon as possible when a point of failure happens. 
So for me, a big part of this is not creating a trust bottleneck. So not being the producer or the lead who is gatekeeping communication between the relevant developers. Um, this means that the, the people with the most context are speaking about issues faster as they occur so that failure is identified sooner and solutions can be identified sooner too. So what you're talking about is building this trust across the board. Absolutely, yeah. At, at all points, at, as much glue as you can possibly build to uh, build that safety net over the chasm that may broaden from time to time when failure occurs. So it is responsibility of everybody to build this safety net. It's not just a group of people that Absolutely. build the safety net. Absolutely, yeah. Although I do think that contributing to being a trustworthy co-development partner and creating an environment where failure can happen and it can be openly discussed and collaboratively resolved is definitely a responsibility of, of everyone on the production unit, for sure. Um, I think if you have nothing else that we've talked about, if you don't have that pyramid of information, <laughs> if you don't have um, a beautiful, clear and precise narrative that you're telling, if you have nothing else but you have trust, then you can do it, you can do code it. Yeah, I agree with that. It, it really speaks about the, the human nature of the people that are doing these things and everything should start with trust. Yes. Uh, well, this is the end of this talk for us. Thank you very much for having listened to myself and Holly. Yeah, thank you. And if you do have any questions about anything that we've talked about, we're really passionate about these topics. We could we have are. spoken for a lot longer. <laughs> uh, so yeah, feel free to reach out, ask us questions. Uh, we could talk about this for days. So thanks to you, Kat, for having us. Bye. Thank you. Bye.